Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne. This is Wilms Front. Brought to you by the Unshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. First up, I've got uh, returning uh, to Wilms Front, uh, Martin North from Digital Finance Analy- Analytics from the, the Way of the World. YouTube channel, which is just shy of uh, 40,000 subscribers. And he also co-hosts uh, Interests of the People webcast with former Liberal advisor, John Adams. Uh, have you been? Uh, things have taken a much more, is, what's, 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 you can say the word catastrophic, uh, unprecedented, or you, you can have a whole uh, uh, pseudonym full of uh, terms to describe the, the current economic situation that we're in. Mm. What, what are your, uh, what words do you use? Well, I actually say quite predictable insofar that whilst the uh, COVID was a trigger, we were always headed in this direction. It was just a matter of when. Uh, because obviously uh, our treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, he was hoping he was going to deliver a budget surplus uh, back in, in May. Uh, I'm sure you you watched his, well, it was a non, uh, not non-budget, it was just a economic update. He, he's not going to deliver the, the full bad news until the second half of, of this year, but he sort of, in the middle of his speech, uh, reminisced about what might have been with his budget surplus. And then, of course, he had that coughing fit, which was, everyone thought, well, well basically summed up the situation. But of course, well, the political line from the coalition has been, this is a one in a century economic uh, event, and uh, we had no idea this was coming. But based on what you've uh, just said uh, it was coming anyway yeah so the point there is clearly the pandemic was not predictable although there were a number of people talking about this ahead of time so over the last five to eight years and in fact i used to run uh, workshops for corporates i used to war game potential futures one potential future was a pandemic so you know it's not completely off off the, off the wall but the point there is that if you look at the economic uh, situation that we're in, the the economy was already slowing. Uh, The reason that the government was able to claim potentially getting a break-even budget was they'd actually throttled back spending. In fact, spending per capita was was below where it had been for, you know, almost a generation. So, you know, it it was not without actually crushing the economy that they were going to do this thing. And we also, of course, have very high deaths and all those other things are in the background. So in a way, that surplus had become an iconic um, target that was having consequences on the economy already. And and now, of course, with COVID, we've got a completely different situation. situation. But my concern is they may go back to their fundamental doctrine, which is, uh, you know, squeeze the um the support as quickly as possible try and get back to a surplus as quickly as possible and i think probably um that's a folly i don't think that this is a situation that we can get to but nevertheless if in fact the lever they're going to pull is the property and housing sector and throw more money at construction which is what they're doing then we're building a bigger sandcastle in the air for later yeah we'll get to the the job uh, was well, it's, it's a home uh, builder program. There, there's so many uh, what you'd call them two uh, two word programs. It used to be uh, I remember they used to call Tony Abbott the three word slogan man. Now Scott Morrison is the the the, the two word program man. Well, I've I've got one for you, and that's called Job Killer, right? Because <laughs> I, I I actually think that uh, there are there is a program it's not spoken about, but it's actually called Job Killer, and we're already seeing it. So. Sometimes he doesn't help uh, help help himself when uh, the, the the leftists uh, they they have that hashtag Scotty uh, for marketing, which is designed yeah. as a, a a demeaning one. But when he comes up with these, it's, it, he actually came up with a. Uh, I covered it a couple of uh, weeks ago or when Craig Kelly was my featured guest there. Yeah, we were entering a job the job maker phase now, which job maker isn't actually. A program. It's just a a two word slogan. What you call it? It's a slogan. Exactly right. Yeah. Now, market marketeers are good at that, right? The trouble is that marketeers aren't necessarily very good at following through, and, and, and it's the follow through that we need if we're really going to take the economy to where we could take it. And that I think is the really important debate from this point, right? We know we've got uh, an issue, but it's where we take the um, 
take the economy and where we place our bets in terms of future investments. And that's a discussion that really is hardly being had at all because we're just reverting to type, unfortunately. And I think there's an alternative narrative that we could talk about that potentially takes us somewhere rather different. And by the way, it overlays things like um, responding to the, you know, the climate change and responding to um, the energy mix that we're going to need into the future. I mean, there's a whole bunch of conversations that we should be having, but the key one is we're not investing in innovation. We're not investing in um, uh, businesses that are going to create new momentum for the future. And that, unfortunately, is going to leave us in a very, very exposed position because our economy is very narrowly based. If you look at it on an international basis, I think we're close to Zimbabwe or somewhere like that, or, you know, Uganda, or, you know, we're right down close to the bottom end in terms of the breadth of the economy and therefore the, the, the sustainability of the economy, unfortunately. You and I would both remember the or oh, the the the, the non-delivered uh, uh, first budget surplus uh, projection, which was 2012, uh, 13, with Wayne Swan saying he was going to deliver. Was that uh, the first day of well, three or four surpluses, and now we've had the the, the second one, and it's been widely uh, spoken about that uh, our Treasury Department ha has. Uh, in engaged in, well, they've had a, a series of dud predictions based on what turns out to be inaccurate economic modeling. And well, it's, it, it, it's, uh, it be, it's un under the microscope more than ever uh, now. Uh, they, well, for example, they projected that unemployment would be 10% uh, by June at 6.2, but what well, that is the people who are looking for work and not underemployed or given up. Well, that, that, that's a dud number. That's a dud number. That's not, that's not the real level of unemployment at all, right? It, it's the uh, manipulated, compressed, managed number. Um, just like the US number, you know, they came at 13.3% for US unemployment, right? The reason for that is that they actually miss miscalculated it firstly, but they've also excluded a lot of people who should be counted but aren't being counted. So it's a dud number. Uh, so uh, we were, well, the, the Treasury numbers showed that our economy contracted by 0.3% uh, the, the March quarter, and well, it's been projected to be 10% for the June quarter. We know it's going to be a, it's going to be a negative uh, growth figure, which the definition of a recession is uh, too, uh, two quarters of negative growth. I, I obviously the, the figure hasn't come through yet, but surely nobody can. June, be wrong. Is, June is going to be worse. I, I predict June will be worse. Uh, so they uh, would say that Treasury is in the in the in the ballpark uh, there, and then of course the the biggest uh, Treasury cock up or whatever you want to call it was the. The, the job keeper uh, numbers where we were told that it was 6.5 million Australians receiving it costing 130 billion and then it was uh, I think three weeks ago now it was it, it was actually 3.5 million on on job keeper and it was now gonna cost uh, 70 billion they blamed some businesses not uh not putting in the forms correctly but then they said oh we 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 also did uh, uh, got this figure through, uh, uh, through we thought that the the lockdown the pandemic was going to last longer so they sort of had when when somebody comes up with sort of a whole range of uh excuses then they, they know themselves that they've stuffed up a big time right and you rem remember when it was released late friday uh, afternoon yeah, right? trash, trash that, that is always you know wh wherever they've got a big issue they don't really want to talk about right you know for example the uh, robo debt thing guess when they announced that they were going to actually um refund people late friday afternoon right? yeah when, when did they release the cash ban legislation late friday afternoon it is a behavior that anything that comes out late friday afternoon have two looks at it because it, it's there for a reason well, I do my other uh, show, Trad Tasman Talk, uh, Fridays uh, at 6 p.m. with my New Zealand counterpart, Duo De Boer. And because Friday afternoon is taking out the trash uh, day uh, for governments, I basically have all this news that I can share with uh, both our respective Australian and New Zealand audience fresh on a, on a Friday night. So they certainly don't get past me. Oh, jolly good and that's right you know it, it, it really is it, it's a method but yeah going, going back to that 60 billions save right 
I was looking at my household surveys right before this came out, and I, I couldn't understand where they were getting the six billion from. I, I wasn't seeing it in my numbers. There wasn't enough households saying that they were getting the support. Now, actually, I think three billion, um, uh, th sorry, three million households is probably too high. Um, I think it's probably going to be lower than that. Um, uh, because, for example, ANZ came out and said half the people um, who asked for mortgage support are getting no income at all. So there's a lot of stuff going on. I'm not sure that the numbers are settled. And that's really the point, right? How do you make policy in the middle of uh, complete rubbery numbers and with complete assumptions that clearly are wide of the mark? Uh, the, qu the key question for me, though, is September, right? So we know that a lot of these programs are due to end at the end of September. And in fact, uh, Morrison today reaffirmed they will run through to end of September. But what happens then, right? Uh, what happens when the banks pull their um, um, interest and principal mortgage holidays? Those are the critical questions I think we should be asking because um, my view would be that if we actually move into se end of September without any subsequent support, that's when we will really see the damage in the economy. And that's when uh, JobKeeper is is due to expire. And this leads on to, well, the, the there's been... The, uh, what you'd call them the well the the amnesty the the grace period and it, it, all of these uh, government uh, uh, temporary welfare programs they're going to have to be wound wound back. I mean the well the the budget deficit is projected to be at uh, one hundred billion, which that's a that's a that's a shocking figure. I've got well. We've just been talking about dud predictions, but we know it's going to be really, really big. Yep. Uh, so yeah, so you're absolutely right that it's the September quarter. That's when the 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 sort of well, it's the the the, the spirit of I, I I would say you know we're all in this together and businesses doing each other's favors and that it's going to be well and truly over by then. And yeah, well that's when well, we will see a second economic devastation wave, uh, to use that term. Well, and remember that the um, September quarter data won't be out until close to Christmas, right? So we won't get a real final read on what the GDP number was in that, in that third quarter until nearly, nearly Christmas time. Um, I think there should be some thoughts about planning for the next 12 to 18 months. You know, the Reserve Bank is saying then the next year the unemployment rate is going to be 7%. Right. Remember, we were at 5.2 percent before this all, all blew up. Right now, the employment rate is, again, artificially low because there are a lot of people who are out of the workforce, not looking for work. They're not that included. And a lot of people in part time work who prefer full time work. They're not included. Um, if you look at the Roy Morgan numbers and you count both the unemployment and the underemployed, then 24 point something percent of the workforce is actually in that category you know, nearly a quarter of all people working. And that's probably closer to the truth. So the point to make there is that whichever way you look at it, later this year into next year, this is going to have significant impact. This is not a V-shaped recovery. And all of these uh, programs, particularly JobKeeper, was rushed out uh, quickly because, mm. well, uh, Centrelink is, is one of the most uh, efficient government uh departments there and so they just came up with this flat flat figure so they could get it out the door but some are receiving more some are receiving less than they would if they're working but i would say the most perverse thing about job keeper is that not all people who've been stood down are entitled to it there's they're, they're not unemployed so they can't get job seeker which is a double of the the new start but they also can't get job keeper i i i would have this this is just me th uh brainstorming now they they could have had say a job keeper for those who've been stood down and say business keeper uh for small businesses to try and keep them uh from going insolvent uh, during this uh pandemic and yeah so look my, my thought is this job keeper of course the way the conduit is businesses, right? So businesses basically have to apply for it and they can only apply under circumstances when, when turnover has gone down. Only certain types of people get it. They've got to be a relatively permanent employee. So, you know, somebody who's been there recently or, you know, short-term, short, short -term, part-time, don't, don't get it. Um, there are businesses who are messaging 
their their accounts, getting their accountants to manage their accounts so that they can get access to the job keeper. Uh, and then, of course, you're tr you're trusting the businesses to pass it on to the employees. And you know, there's no data as to what proportion of job keeper pay to businesses is being passed on to to employees. What they should have done, my view is, they should have used the universal basic income model instead, which essentially is cutting out the middleman, cutting out the businesses, and uh, basically supporting um, individuals through this particular crisis. Um, now, that would have actually led to higher unemployment figures because by definition you wouldn't have been employed, but it would have actually been one, a more economically efficient way of doing it, and two, it would have been uh, less easy to obfuscate what's going on. I think a lot of what's going on at the moment is deliberately vague and it's deliberately confused because they don't really want too much transparency about what's going on. That's my theory. It could be wrong, but that, that's how I read it. Which is all political because, <laughs> well, the, the, the political history is that uh, it's almost impossible for a government to be re-elected re during uh, a recession, even though in uh, well, federally in Australia, uh, another uh, election is not due for the, the, the second half of uh, 2021 in my home state of Victoria. Uh, it's not until November 2022 and New South Wales, uh, March uh, 2023. So they uh, there, there is enough electoral time for them just to uh, uh, just fully give us the give us the truth, and and then base their their coming re-elections on how they deal with the the aftermath. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, yeah, we're talking politics, right, rather than rationality, right? Remember that the the the, the art of politics is to get re-elected. Right? Mm. So you can be pretty sure that those in power at the moment at the federal level, their main concern is to make sure that home prices are still relatively high as they come to the next election, which is one of the reasons why they're throwing all this stimulus money at the construction sector to try and support the property sector, to, to try and support house prices, right? So, so um, I, I get frustrated because there's, there's, there's a set of rationalities that you can apply if you really wanted to fix the economy and move Australia forward. And there's a set of rationalities you apply if effectively what you're trying to do is just model through to the next election and try and get re-elected again. And I th unfortunately think that the quest for power has overtaken long-term strategic thought, not just here, but around the world, um, insofar that um, politicians' main objective seems to me to be um, getting uh, re-elected. In fact, I interf interviewed a couple of weeks ago from my channel um, a senator um, uh, 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 from Queensland who's on the... Uh, liberal side of the house as it were and he's completely frustrated because he's saying we're not doing the big things we should be doing we're not actually laying down the foundations for investing in the future to be able to create some um, a sustainable long-term economy for Aust australia and for businesses and those sorts of things and you know he's in there and he's seeing all of these shenanigans going on and he was actually able to come on and uh, um you know spend half an hour with me explaining why um what essentially they're doing isn't necessarily the right thing to do. It's pretty critical of the Reserve Bank too, too by the way. As well. But there is a political agenda and then there is a rational strategic agenda. And it's the political agenda that takes centre stage all the time. So everything is made as a decision, taken as a decision through the political lens. And unfortunately, uh, as a result of that, some people win, but a lot of people, a lot of ordinary Australians will lose. There's also the the other part of that is the uh, uh, entrenched group thinking the bureaucracy or, or deep state, uh, whatever you want to call it. And the perfect example of the fact is that nothing is done about the, the Murray-Darling Basin plan or, or authority. It's... Uh, there's numerous examples of the bureaucracy just yeah, running the show according to their agenda and politicians being too timid to uh, upset any of that. Yeah, well, you, you're talking about neoliberalism, right, which is essentially the fundamental doctrines that we actually have here in the US and in the UK. And, and essentially it's um, uh, led to a particular set of uh, behaviours and discussions, you know, uh, one of them is that debt, more debt is better than smaller debt, particularly in this consumer sector and in the um, in the private sector. So, you know, get people to borrow more. Uh, another is that when you borrow, you have to pay it back, whatever, regardless, you know. So so there's, the, there's, there's that cycle there. There's another cycle that says, 
um, the state should effectively pull its horns back as far as it could. Although on that one, I would say that um, the Morrison go government now is as uh, neoliberal as, uh, a as a dead fish. Um, insofar that the amount of money they're throwing in the system. But, you know, there are doctrinal positions that people are taking. Um, and, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is that um, um, neoliberalism has not served, you know, ordinary Australians at all well. We're paying a lot more than we ever did for our housing. Um, we have uh, income growth slower than it's been for at least, um, you know, 10 years or something. Um, we have um a rate of unemployment now which is obviously very high because of COVID, but was always rising previously we had a strong migration which was putting huge pressure on our cities and on our infrastructure and there was uh, you know very much um the the australian version of quantitative easing was migration 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 so interesting question now with migration being being turned off and then the final element which is the cornerstone of it is the property finance um debt axis and if you look carefully at what's happened in terms of the economy sure we did dug up some iron ore and flogged it to china and we we sell a few uh, agricultural things but the bulk of what we've done is to actually use the um, housing finance debt uh sort of cycle again and again to give people the perception of greater wealth to lift house prices to lift debt and, uh, you know, just remember, we're lifting both sides. So basically, debt goes up, house prices go up, debt go up, house prices go up. Who wins? The banks. The banks have bigger balance sheets than they've had previously. Um, and that, in theory, translates into greater profits for their shareholders. That's a little bit off at the moment, of course. Um, but actually, that means that a greater proportion of people in Australia now are renters than ever before. We've got a greater proportion of people uh, with a mortgage than ever before and so the own house owning proportion in other words people who own their houses outright has dropped over the last few years and more people are moving into retirement still with a mortgage so they're basically debt laden for long i mean all of these things it's all part of an agenda yeah? and uh, unfortunately that the agenda as you say is actually very much wired into the way that uh, you know the um the treasury and the other institutions of state and power um, all think the same stuff. Unfortunately, of course, it's not just here, but around the world, you know, central banks, money printing, all those things. They're all thinking the same stuff. Unfortunately, I don't think it's necessarily the right stuff. Uh, just I want to go back to uh, Treasury uh, forecasting for a moment, because these are supposed to be some of the best uh, economic minds uh, in Australia. They're, a lot of the senior ones are paid at least six figures. And so you expect them to... <laughs> Well, but hang on, look, there's a, there's an interesting debate here, right? If you look at the Reserve Bank, there's a guy called Peter Tulip there who wrote a paper quite recently, a couple of years ago, saying the function of house prices is driven by interest rates. As interest rates drop, house prices go up, right? And, you know, there are people out there who are saying house prices are going to go up because interest rates are, are much lower. In their model, they don't think about debt at all. Debt is not a problem, right? Because basically debt and assets grow together and they sort of cancel each other out. So that, so that in their model, they don't think about debt. I don't understand how you can model the economy and not think about the function of debt and how de debt actually drives what's going on because it's such a, a fundamental issue. But no, that's the way the economy works. So uh, those great brains, you know, the people paid lots of big dollars, uh, seem to me to be completely blinkered. And uh, there's always been and still is this focus on consumer confidence and consumer uh, spending and obviously uh, since we last spoke uh, there was the the panic buying which was not just uh, uh, supermarkets and and toilet paper it also spread because uh, uh, there was the the work from home uh, order uh, as well there was a lot of shortages printers of, computers yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. and uh, so there is now this, I would say, hindsight that, oh, that was actually a good thing, all that, uh, all that uh, mass uh, consumption uh, fueled by, by panic in, in propping up the uh, economy. But, and this is the old Keynesian uh, uh, trap that, uh, that the economy is demand consumption driven, which doesn't create any more new products. Mm. 
Yeah. So um, there was a massive spike in one month. But if you look at the most recent retail figures, it dropped off a cliff, right? Because essentially now everybody's stocked up with pretty much everything. Um, they're not buying at all. And in fact, the household confidence numbers came back a little bit, improved a little bit this time, but you know, the latest Roy Morgan and Melbourne Institute numbers also. Um, but they're still well down from where it is long-term average. So we haven't really recovered uh, completely. Business confidence is um, still quite low, although it's a little bit up as well. Um, but um, my view is that there was definitely um, a, uh, a realignment of spending patterns through the, um, the panic. And, you know, it's quite logical when people feel that they're not in control and people weren't feeling in control because of the fact that the uh, virus was there. Um, one of the things you can do is to take control by buying stuff and storing stuff and you know at least you've got enough blue roll right so there there's, there's a psychological reason why people do it but actually i'm not sure that this is really going to help the economy long term we also know that of course inventories will, will run down some of those inventories have not been able to be replenished yet because internationally the supply chains aren't working as, as they were so so we already have an economy that's um a bit shaky but the question now is and this is the really interesting thing. There were businesses who were okay for the first two or three months because they already had work and they had contracts that they were delivering, but they're coming to an end and now they've got no work. So I'm in my SME service. I'm seeing a lot more how, uh, businesses now saying our inventory and our pipeline of work is just evaporating. And um, unless that changes in the next month or two, we're going to have to lay more people off. So in a way, we haven't seen the, the bulk of the impact yet. And, you know, like I said, you know, this is going to play out not over a few weeks, but it's going to be another 18 months or so. And by the way, did you see that the Fed basically said they're going to be buying bonds for five years? So they're thinking that this thing is going to go on for a very long period of time. I've uh, spoken to a lot of uh, small business people and, and also those who, who work in the, the parts and, and manufacturing sector and uh, there's a famous uh, libertarian essay by by leonard reed called called i pencil which talks about uh, how to make a simple pencil uh, and you've got to have all these parts and that and and that's how a market works and i've i've come up with this uh, well 21st century application of i pencil that how much of that pencil uh, this hypothetical pencil now uh, relies on parts from China because even even though a lot of things were, are made locally, uh, not all the products are sourced locally or all the the parts for the capital and the machines. And so this was well, to, to use the expression, uh, putting spanners in the works or or uh, nuts in the in in the machines uh, because uh, even though well the borders were shut to, to people uh, this still affected uh, a lot of uh, cargo and we'll go into the the geopolitical uh, trade implications later but it, you you talked about uh, you're a critic of of neo uh, liberalism and uh, this is an example of where uh, reliance on this uh, globalized neoliberal system has come back to bite us well, it has. And, um, you know, the, the bankers are doing fine. And uh, of course, all of the banks around the world and the financial system are being supported by this massive liquidity printing. The Fed has printed um, something like uh, three point something trillion since last September. So we had the um, the repo crisis in last September. That's another reason why I'm saying there was a crisis already coming. Right. The repo market blew up in September. The Fed threw a lot of liquidity at it and has been at it ever since. So they've they've printed three point something trillion. The balance sheet, the Fed balance sheet is now seven point something trillion. But the bulk of that increase hasn't flowed into the real economy. It hasn't flowed into real businesses and households in the US. Um, but what it's done is to flow into the financial system. And so what they've done is bolstered the financial system. But the financial system is not connected to the real system not connected to the real economy. That's why we've got uh, stock markets that are very high. That's why we've had a really big bounce back in terms of stock values. But you know, if you measure the success of the Fed in terms of the financial system and the stock markets, and they've done a great job, but if you measure the success of the Fed in terms of the way that it's actually helped real businesses and real households, then no, they've hardly done anything. There's, there's a program called PPP in the, the US, which is effectively a program to try and um, send money to businesses and to send money to households when they're needed. Now that took 
a lot of um, political intervention to get that, and it's a much smaller program relative to the rest of it. So if you ask how much of the Fed's um, uh, momentum is actually supporting the real economy, it's not very much at all. Now, if you go back to the question of China and Australia, I saw a figure the other day that suggested that 38 of the a percent of the overall economy in Australia is reliant on China, 38%, right? Now, if I was a business and I basically had 38% of my business coming from one single customer, um, I would regard that as a key strategic risk for my business. I would want to diversify. And the fact that we've been allowed to and enabled to essentially put more and more and more of our eggs into the China basket has created the problem we've now got, which means that we were actually being held hostage, you know. So China can say, well, we know we don't think that you're treating them Chinese students well, so we, we won't let them come back now. And uh, that means that the education sector, which is the third biggest um, uh, earner for Australia, suddenly is going to be, you know, off key. Um, uh, so how, however you look at it, you know, we need to find a path that's different going forward. Um, you know, there are, okay, people talking about India, another, you know, a big economy and potentially has some things there. But I want to try and say, well, hang on a moment. Why don't we see what we could really do locally? So the analogy of the pencil, you know, well, maybe we should try and build more of the pencil locally. Maybe we should invest more in terms of those innovative businesses that do exist in Australia. And maybe we should focus on trying to help some of those really come to life. Um, and it's interesting because I got a call last week from um, uh, somebody very senior in one of the um, big technology firms that's based in Australia, does global business, was based in Australia. And they were saying they are completely frustrated at the government's lack of understanding and focus on creating local businesses and creating local innovation. It's like pushing um, a big stone uphill all the time to try and get anything to work. And uh, it's much easier to take the business offshore and uh, you know go over to the US or go somewhere else because the environment there is much easier to create the business growth they want. Now, they're still here because they believe it's important, but they want to have some conversations with me and perhaps use my channel to help try and push this idea of we've got to invest in local business. We have to invest in innovation here. We have to create more of the pencil onshore rather than just saying, well, it was China this, this year and we're going to go and use India next year. Well, one of the uh, uh, developments that has uh, occurred uh, during the, the the pandemic, which and uh, Daniel Andrews's expression uh, "get on the beers," that's now entered uh, folklore. And uh, when the Northern Territory was uh, uh, reopening uh, pubs, uh, there, there was apparently a frantic uh, effort to, to make sure all the beer could get into the territory on time. But what's happened uh, this year is that. This uh, Japanese beer maker, uh, Ashani, they, they already own a lot of uh, beers sold in Australia. They've now bought uh, Carlton and United breweries. So, so VB will be owned by the, the Japanese. Obviously, uh, this, is, this is not the 1940s anymore, so we don't need to be worried about uh, the, the, the Japanese. But it goes to your point that a lot of our beers, uh, which we... We are one of the, the biggest consumers, both responsible and irresponsible, of alcohols now owned owned by a single country. Mm. Well, in fact, go further. If you look at a lot of the big businesses here in Australia, a lot of the investment that actually goes into those businesses comes from overseas. And so we have big overseas investments and investors. And guess where all the value goes? when they create shareholder returns, it goes back to those overseas investors. So essentially, um, we are relying on international flows of funds in to get the working capital. And then they basically take all that um, value back out again. And we are left with just the pickings. I mean, you know, that's not a good basis for creating a sustainable uh, economy, in my view, in the future. But that's the way it's currently configured. Well, you and I are both in the, the media uh, industry, and it, it, I guess it gives us op optimism that uh, probably two of the, of the most uh, successful global audiovisual companies, uh, Rode Microphones and Blackmagic Cameras, are uh, Australian companies. So <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, you, I use them both because I actually want to support local and actually make darn good products at a reasonable good price. So uh, good on them. Yep, uh, same here, and what's well, their innovative uh, products as well? They're 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 bloody amazing. Yep, I agree. Well, I couldn't do what I do on my shows with uh, without the that is precisely those brands. I mean, they 
probably 90% of the gear that I have is um, either black magic or road. So yeah, I, I'm on a road mic. I'm on a black magic switcher even as we speak. When you and I last spoke, uh, we were we were talking about the uh, the cash ban, which had got the the sign off from the the Senate uh, committee. Uh, but uh, we saw during the the pandemic a a self uh, a self imposed cash ban by by many biz, uh, businesses who said they were no longer accepting cash because of uh, uh, the risk of coronavirus transmission uh obviously the the big major uh retailers such as supermarkets still accepted cash though they did discourage it and a lot of banks increase increase their uh, their their tap and go to to 200 uh, and uh, you mentioned about well the historical thing about uh, the fed and reserve banks they print money but it's obviously digital now, uh, people didn't need much encouragement to embrace a, a cashless society or a government decree. Yeah, but there's a difference, isn't there, between saying you can choose to use either cash or you can choose to go electronic. And, you know, I personally use electronic most of the time because it's more convenient. That's different from having the liberty taken from you to use cash if you want to use it, which is what the cash ban was about, right? Above $10,000, mm. although it might uh, come down later. There's a, fun, there's a philosophical divide oh, between yeah, those two positions, I, right? I yeah. agree. Uh, yeah. but, but certainly uh, the, there is not as much scrutiny now on the cash ban as there, as there was yeah, but it's So it's stuck at the moment. So basically, we don't know what the Liberal Party is going to do. Um, uh, There are some people who believe that um, they just want to keep quiet about the cash ban and let it die quietly because it's created so much much political embarrassment. I mean, we, you know, we had three and a half thousand submissions to the Treasury, two and a half thousand submissions to the, uh, the Senate inquiry. The Senate report basically said, well, you'd have to make some major changes to the legislation if it was to progress. And so it's just got stuck. So we don't know quite where it is. There are some people who think that's going to go quietly. There are other people who think that um, the, the Liberal Party will bring it back at some point um, after making some changes. And the other point to make is that both the World Health Organization, and you know, I don't necessarily believe everything they say, but they actually made it quite clear. They don't believe that um, uh, notes is any worse a carrier than anything else. And the Reserve Bank published... Uh, under a freedom of information inquiry about two weeks ago some documents again saying the same thing that uh, essentially all the analysis that's been done around the world is that notes don't have any more of a risk of carrying the um uh, the virus than any other form so actually there is no reason to ban cash uh out of the covid right um now going back to the convenience thing sure it's convenient for many people and people you know like to use electronic quite often uh, but there are some people who still don't and you know some older people prefer to use cash some older people don't feel comfortable with the with the technology and i remind you what happened on the south coast over christmas when all the power went off right yes yeah, and suddenly this story. and suddenly nobody could buy anything other than with real money and that's really my point. Um, I think we should have the option of using real money notes if we want to. Um, we shouldn't have our civil liberties eroded by saying thou shalt not use it in this particular circumstance with the risk that they then take the uh, limit down and down and down and basically displaces cash completely. But on the other hand, it's something which you know is good to be there, but I don't think we need to be um, religious about it. If people want to use digital, fine. If people want to use cash, fine. But we should have both options. Well, I don't want anybody in Canberra dictating what I can and can't do on that particular issue. Yeah, I completely uh, agree. And uh, I'm like you, I use uh, digital transactions quite frequently. The The point I was trying to make without with, with some businesses saying they refuse to uh, accept cash is just that it's more, it's more, it's, it, it's a private nudge uh, towards, uh, well, uh, coercing people because if you want to to pay in cash for 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 things i i interviewed uh a couple of months ago max eigen who who lives uh uh remotely and uh he uh pays for everything in in cash and uh he had to keep kick uh qu- up quite a quite a stink with local businesses and basically make the point that it says legal tender on it you can't refuse to 
to, uh, to accept it and they eventually relented and that. But you see what I mean here that because we do know that pri uh, private companies, they, can, they, they do wield a lot of power over our lives, especially when they work in unison. Oh, yeah. And the, clearly the banks want to get rid of cash. There's no doubt about that. You know, they've published lots of reports and lots of opinion pieces saying, you know, cash is going to disappear very quickly. And, um, uh, and why? Because costs of handling cash are very high. So if you've got to have cash in your bank vault, you have to have security, you have to have all of the, um, you know, protections of it. And it's hard to handle. So if you can get rid of it, fine. And, but again, my, my argument would be, we should have the right to use cash as for as long as we want to use it. If at some point in the future, everybody says, oh, well, you know, cash has really just run its course and we don't need it anymore. That's fine. Different place. But trying to impose a cash ban based on a very badly argument, very badly placed argument about money laundering and, and, and on all those things and the gangs and all those things, and then trying to justify and post rationalize it afterwards. Um, you know, no, we, 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 shone, we shone a spotlight on that and uh, the politicians will run away. So let's <laughs> see where it goes. Uh, definitely. Uh, well, there's, uh, we were told that uh, this uh, pandemic and the, the restrictions were, would last for at least six months. That were the words that came out of Scott Morrison's mouth. And mm. there was a lot of bipartisanship for a while, but I'm not sure if you watch, uh, uh, watch Parliament today, but it's de definitely the, the era of bipartisanship it's falling apart. It falling is apart. over. And <laughs> yeah. now is the, the, the time to, well, for example, the cash, cash ban, but other, uh, contentious, uh, policies that they, they, they try to, to, to rush through. Now's the time to sort of say, hang on, no, you're not going to get away with this. Uh, don't think we're not, we're not looking like, for example, the new ASIO, uh, power for, for warrantless, uh, surveillance. Yeah. So, I mean, if you count up the number of days that parliament has actually been in sitting since the start of the year, I think it's as low as it's ever been, right? So the amount of parliamentary scrutiny that there is, and okay, there are Senate committees and what have you else working behind the scenes, but no, there's there's very little scrutiny. And in fact, I would argue that um, Morrison's been dodging scrutiny for quite some time, probably you know, since they got back actually. Um, and this was another convenient reason for not calling parliament back. So not surprised when parliament is back, people are starting to exercise their voice and saying, well, we need a bit more exposure to this and as you say the um, security legislation and other pieces of legislation need to be looked at and that is the role of parliament there should be active discussion and analysis of legislation that's what they're there for and frankly if um, we get more and more pieces of legislation nodded through um, you know by directive or um, um, by effectively just changing the words on an annex rather than the bit itself which is what happens with with some legislation um, we are losing the power of democracy and I think that's a real problem well in my home state of Victoria uh, I was talking about at the beginning of my show that Daniel Andrews has the the unilateral power to decree a state of emergency and the conditions of that mm. state of emergency it was an act passed by Parliament uh, but it's it, it it it's it it rests more power in the executive. Parliament has given a given away power, and the United States, which has much uh, ha, ha, in its constitution, has a much more distinct uh, distinct difference in the powers between the executive and the, the legislature. Uh, stuff like that is uh, is well, it's supposed to be unconstitutional uh, but obviously that's not how it works in in, in practice well no and, and you know the trouble is if you're not careful you can end up with the dictatorial behavior right so basically people on a whim can say i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do that and um, we've seen some of that in the uk recently with um you know boris and some of the things that he's done um uh you know i don't know whether you saw but they were going to allow schools to come back um until a few days ago and suddenly they've decided no we're not, we're not going to allow schools to come back now until september and, and that's pretty much been just a sort of a plucked out of the air and just they've changed the um they changed the rules and that sort of um uh you know mercurial behavior of leaders really concerns me I and mean, we see it in the us with trump we see it of course in china uh we see it in other places too and um i think that uh we should just pause and think about 
those people who are there to make decisions on our behalf need to be accountable for those decisions and there needs to be the right checks and balances and um, you know processes to ensure that democracy is actually um, uh, maintained because it's very easy to give up on that and allow more and more of decisions to be taken by uh, almost divine right um, very hard to crawl back from that and I just worry that we're losing freedom to left right and center and frankly we're we're just asleep we're just letting it all happen and um, the political class don't seem to be too worried about it but uh, I'm pretty worried about it you know I think there should be more active vocal opposition to some of this because you know if you just have people who can at a whim make a decision and actually not really even have to self-justify it uh, and not answer any questions about it I think it's a big deal well, you mentioned that uh, the, the robo-debt uh, repayments was uh, one of the, the Friday afternoon trash-taking exercises, uh, probably by, uh, I think most people would, uh, would uh, who are in the, the political know, would uh, probably agree by the most incompetent minister in the, the Morrison government, uh, One of many. <laughs> Stuart, Stuart Robert, uh, James Campbell from the Herald Sun, uh, I, think, I think he probably... Uh, <laughs> was the was the most savage saying he's he's seen uh, as a clown and of course he's overseen most of this robo debt uh, debacle and it's a pretty outrageous uh, program that the government uh, ran which well, a court decision said it was illegal to come up with this uh, computer generated uh, income averaging formula not on it's not based on any actual uh, figures on what people earn or it, it it is just based on what we think you are. We've got all the resources of the federal government to, to throw at you and harass you. And it caused so much uh, mental harm uh, in people. And this is why I recommend uh, to most people avoid Centrelink if you if you can and they uh, i talked about how they're the most incompetent uh, government or uh, department because they 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 constantly incorrectly pay people but uh, you're held responsible for their mistakes i've had uh, first-hand experience for that and to for a government to harass its citizens like that and uh, basically Stuart Roberts said yeah we made a mistake where we're, we're, we're going to be repaying what we uh, uh, what we illegally took uh, from you there's just no sense that there's no sorry or, or anything like that uh, and I don't know whether you've seen but there's some of the media stuff on this is quite interesting they won't say sorry because they're worried that if they do that might actually lead um, into further legal action so they're trying to Good. actually well, I think I agree. I mean, they, they, they should and they should be exposed. The second one, I don't know whether you saw, but I think it was on um, Q&A on Monday night on the ABC. Uh, there was a guy there uh, representing the government. I think it was a senator. And he basically was arguing that, of course, the government is there to try and maintain the um, uh, you know, integrity of the tax system and to make quite sure that every dollar that's actually uh, taxpayer's dollar is actually used for the best possible purpose, right? And it was like, yeah and what about all you know all the rest of the stuff that like the uh, you know the sports rorts and those sorts yeah. of things what you know about their, I can give... the, their government contracts they gave to the companies to carry out robo debt what about those taxpayers dollars exactly and it's like um yeah well that 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 argument doesn't fly very well and then the other point of course it's completely unequal as you said because you've got all the power of government and centrelink uh, and, and the ato against a small you know a small person or uh, people who really obviously don't have very little resources to be able to fight this and often will, um, you know, just want to get, get shot of it. So a lot of people were forced to pay when they didn't actually think that they were due to pay. Um, I mean, this is, this is one of the biggest, most scandalous things that I think have gone on. And I, I think that rather than just um, refunding, um, there should be absolute compensation and their you know and Agreed. also i'd make the point that there have been a number of um suicides uh, you know and, and uh, massive social disruption to people because of the robo debt thing and nobody wants to talk about that so this is a a major scandal uh, and i think i think the minister should actually go on the back of it but uh, no he'll be protected well he's already been uh, gone once that was over a was it a a junket he he took to to china uh, of all places about 
five years ago that, uh, but uh, uh, mo mo most of us conclude that he only got back in the, the ministry because he and ScoMo were uh, a church uh, buddies and well, it was all right for Stuart Robert to uh, uh, pay back uh, the the excess internet charges that he incurred, something like thirty seven thousand dollars. He doesn't get uh, in trouble or anything like that; just pays it back. Well, it's one law for them, one for every else. Mm. And of course, eventually he'll end up with a um, you know one of these gongs like um, uh, Bronwyn did and like uh, Tony did, right? <laughs> well. I was, it's funny you mentioned Bronwyn Bishop. I, uh, obviously, Chopper Gate is in is inexcusable. But I see her on Sky today, and she's the, she she she's one of the the few ones who's who's calling out the the march of the the communists and and socialists uh, these days. So she's not too bad yeah. now, but they all are after they've left Parliament. Yeah, and uh, you know, with, on on a nice big pension, of course, and uh, you know, the, the the public sector, of course, do very well out of uh, us taxpayers through their political career and beyond. Um, just remind everybody about that, and of course, not many of the public sector um, senior, you know, the polys have actually given up any of their um, salary increases, uh, as I recall. Um, one rule for them, one rule for us. Well, they, they, they only ever engage in a pay freeze. It, it, they, <laughs> they never take a, a cut where a lot of uh, businesses, uh, even up to the, the CEO, have taken actual pay cuts. And of course, the, 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 the classic example is the ABC claiming that Cunding's been uh, cut when it's being either frozen or they're, they're, they're not going to pay the, the increases that were put into the budget. Yeah, and of course the budget is, you know, what's a budget? Well, how much is a budget should be? But no, there is there is definitely one set of behaviours within the political system and there's one set of behaviours in the real world. And I actually come back quite often to a fundamental point, which is it's very hard, it seems to me, for politicians to actually act in the real interests of the real people when they've never really been exposed to the issues that real people have. And uh, for me, that's one of the most critical um, points you know, there, there's a political machine and people quite often people um, go through the political machine and ultimately end up going into parliament and then effectively they've really been insulated from, you know, real everyday life. Um, and I think that's a real shame because essentially if you talk to real people, you know, as I do through my surveys, um, the story of real Australians at the moment, it, a lot of them are actually in quite severe difficulty and they're uncertain about what's happening and where, where the country is going and what the right policies need to be. If you talk to the SME sector, a lot of the SMEs are actually really up against the wall. Um, it's like, um, you know, whatever the polys say and do, it's a million miles from reality. Well, uh, let's uh, give uh, more scrutiny now to, well, their, their latest uh, initiative, which we've already mentioned, Home Builder, which uh, <laughs> just to... Uh, I would say correct uh, uh, some misconceptions about property. It's not uh, investment; it's uh, consumption, and uh, this is what uh, this program. It's basically to encourage further further consumption in the construction industry. But in terms of, I would say, f uh, fairness uh, of of. Uh, it basically is a welfare program. It's it, the, the language being used is that you already had to have all your your ducks uh, in a row to either renovate or build a new home. There's only there's a well, less than six month window to take advantage of this twenty five dollar uh, cash uh, cash grant. It's unfair and a real dud, and it's uh, not what's required either. No, I think the whole program was designed to appease the construction sector um, who were lobbying very hard. And so, you know, ScoMo can turn around and say, see, we've done that. But actually it's very poorly constructed. Um, it's gonna be targeting on a particular set of people. Probably if you think about it with the income bands that they've got and the um, 150,000 you know, cost minimum, um, there aren't that many people who could afford to, to, to do that. Uh, but if you're in WA, right? Not only can you get that program, but you can get another program as well. And if you add all the programs up from the various sources, state and federal, um, I think in total the taxpayers and GST payers 
are going to provide something like seventy thousand dollars for somebody going to buy a home. Um, I don't see how that can possibly be right. Uh, not only will it lift home prices further, particularly in that sector of the market, so prices will just go up a bit. Um, it's going to put huge pressure, of course, on um, uh, the existing property pool, which isn't really being supported in the same way because it's all about new bills to try and construct uh, activity for the construction sector. So I think this is one of the most misplaced programs. And, uh, you know, a number of people have, have basically said, well, they're all going to be doing this building anyway. So you're just, you know, you're not really giving them uh, extra incentives and just giving them some money. Um, there are other people saying, well, it might bring forward a few but not that many. But what about social housing? Surely, you know, if you were going to actually want to create significant momentum in the construction sector and create long-term value for Australia, that's now's the time for building some social housing and get on with it um, because we have a housing sector issue in the social sector. We have a lot of people who can't afford uh, housing because of the uh, massively stupid policies for the last 30 years. And, um, you know, if you were going to spend some money, spend it there. So I think this whole plan program is a complete dud. Um, but it's going to um, no doubt, uh, you know, win uh, those empower a few friends from the construction sector. My uh, premier, uh, Daniel Andrews, one of his uh, biggest uh, electoral uh, winners uh, is the the uh, the infrastructure uh, blitz. Uh, where I live in the the southeast, uh, he's uh, been removing the the level crossings on our on our train line, which obviously. It means that uh, traffic is significantly less congested uh, during uh, peak hour, and it's not surprising on the, the Frankston, Pakenham and Cranbourne lines, he won all those seats at the last uh, state election. Uh, he's uh, currently building the, the rail loop uh, through the CBD and also unveiled the suburban uh, rail loop, and he's talking about to kickstart the Victorian uh, economy again, which he shut down and continues to keep uh, shut down. He wants uh, more uh, infrastructure. And this is where uh, his uh, signing that memorandum of understanding uh, with China about their one belt, one road program, uh, the, the, the state finances are already uh, uh, deteriorating because of this uh, public works uh, investment and the speculation is he wants to get some financing uh, from uh, China as well. This is a two-part, uh, I, I would say, analysis for you. First, the, the value of this big infrastructure build, even though he is building it, he, he has a history of not getting value for money. And the second of uh, Chinese financing. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about infrastructure first. We absolutely do need to, uh, if we're going to kick, you know, kickstart the economy, and get going. We need to actually have more momentum, and it's quite right that and appropriate for government to fund some of that. And funding appropriate infrastructure investments, I think, makes a lot of sense. We need to build for the future, rather than just um, building more rabbit hutches for the for the current that we don't need. We've got a million spare properties already across Australia. We don't need any more spare houses, right? But there's a, there's a really important question then about what processes are used to determine which infrastructure should be built and how it should be built and how it should be funded. Uh, my worry is that um, in New South Wales, we have sold off a lot of our infrastructure to foreign owners in recent times. And, and so basically what happens is that the public sector builds infrastructure and then flogs it off to get the capital. Uh, and I think that's a major mistake. We should be owning some of our critical systems and processes and infrastructure, I, I believe, for the public good, right? And it goes back to this neoliberalism idea. I don't believe it. I believe that there is actually a role for government to provide um, world-class infrastructure for, uh, for our um, our futures. And uh, my own view is that we should be measuring the outcome on the economy, not in terms of GDP, but actually in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the benefit to the wellness, to, or the, you know, the, the livability uh, and the benefit to the people in the country. That would be how I'd, I'd measure it. So I think that will be a really good test for some of the infrastructure that's being built. Uh, I think some of the stuff that is being built is probably the wrong stuff. And I think that, uh, again, it's being built um, not necessarily efficiently and not necessarily to, to good spec. Remember, we have a lot of issues at the moment in quality of construction 
um, in Australia at the moment. That's one of the big issues I think we have to come back to to make sure that it's well built. So that's the first point. On China and funding from China, yeah, the Belt and Road is very interesting because China has actually actively used this program all the way around the world to extend its tentacles and influence. And um, what it basically does is provide um, funding so that they can actually go build stuff. Obviously, China funds it, but also China then actually provides a lot of the uh, expertise and activity and uh, even people to build it. So a lot of it is actually creating activity for China rather than actually activity locally, although it's built locally. But then it's connected back to the, to the, to the tentacles of China, and effectively that gives China a long, long lead of control. So the question is, if you if you actually think of Victoria now saying we want to build a Belt and Road, and uh, you know China then starts throwing money down here and starts building infrastructure down here, um, it's a very interesting question as to what's the connectivity then between what that infrastructure is and back to China. What influences will there be formally and informally? And um, there have been a couple of books written. I interviewed somebody um, from down in Canberra quite recently who made the point that um, the soft power that China uses through Belt and Road and through um, you know, the media and through other mechanisms is very, very powerful in terms of setting an agenda that's pro-China. And so you've got to look at Belt and Road in that aspect as well as just the pure money flows and whether you get value out of the back of it. Um, I think we should be quite cautious. Um, uh, by the way, I also think we should be cautious of our relationship with the US um, as well, because of course there are a lot of people who say, US good, China bad. I would say China, US, very similar in terms of behaviours. They might look uh, at a sort of a, a superficial level very different, but if you look at the behaviours and the way they influence and how they pursue their own agendas, there's more commonality than difference in my view. Well, we talked about uh, before that uh, our beer security is well it's, yeah, reliant on uh, Japan now, but our our fuel uh, security we've decided to have uh, some fuel reserve now, but they're over in the United States. They're not even mm. in Australia, so it's mm. not not national security at all. No, it's basically a smoke and mirrors again. They can now claim that they've got 90 days supply rather than 30 days supply. I think 90 days was recommended globally as the, the standard, right? And we were down at 30 days. Uh, so basically, if there was a blow up in the Middle East, we'd be out of oil very quickly. So we've now got 90 days worth, except it's not here. <laughs> it's in the US, right? And, uh, you know, you've you got to say, if we had um, a, a mercurial president uh, in the US and we actually upset them, they could turn around and say, no, you aren't having it, right? And they could say, well, it will take you to the, the world, you know, the, the global court, and that will take for years. So you could see a scenario where, in fact, um, you know, just at the point when you need it, you can't get it. No, it's nonsense. We should be building again. We need infrastructure locally. We need to actually build capability to be able to hold the resources that we need here for our own peace and security. We can't rely on extended supply chains and on uh, mateship with um, you know people in other parts of the world because I think the global order is changing quite quickly and you know my view is that all of the, um, the you know the globalization that we had um, in terms of um, you know the degree of trust and all those that's all beginning to decay and I think we have to look after our own interests and we actually have, need to have more of our stuff locally here in our control so that we can actually maintain. Um, our lifestyle, whatever happens with regard to some of the international crises, which will blow up again and again, I think, ahead. So, yeah, I, I, I'm a very sceptical of this oil thing. I think it's just a, a bit of a, a bit of a sort of a posturing rather than being real. Well, let's talk uh, end with some of the silver economic linings, uh, because there, there, there has been a, a few minor good uh, economic developments out of this coronavirus pandemic when the, the panic yeah. buying was uh, occurring we saw those uh, curfews on deliveries just uh, slash immediately so 24 7 deliveries could take place uh, there's now well i hope it finally happens this time completely deregulating of, of shop trading hours in new south wales pharmacies are able to trade 24 7 they also allowed takeaway alcoholic cocktails uh, because obviously uh, with the, the pubs, the cafes, restaurants shut, they could only do uh, takeaway. And in times of economic crisis, that's when you get some drastic, immediate, unnecessary economic regulation slashed. 
Mm. Well, I agree. But also, I think what's interesting is this idea of working from home. Um, you know, I don't think we're going to see the demand for office space in our CBDs ever be the same again. It's clear to me that people have now twigged that they don't have to spend an hour commuting into the centre of town to go and work in an office and then come home again, right? They can actually do a lot more um, where they are now. And uh, I think that's going to be a profound change. Also, did you see 11% of um, retail is now online? It jumped from 5% to 11%. Um, I think that's another nail in the coffin of retail. So we are seeing some profound changes and, uh, you know, the future is going to be more digital. The future is going to be more devolved. Uh, that could even have impacts on home prices in different places. For example. It could have impact on um, the future retail estates um, and, uh, you know, even real estate um, trusts, right? Because a lot of these retail um, uh, sectors, you know, all the shops and everything else are owned by these big trusts and they're actually now going to struggle with vacancies so i mean there are there are big profound changes off the back of this but as you say also some um, some good things one of the things i think is good is that uh, uh, i now have trained my um, local delivery people to just leave things here rather than have to uh, wait for me to sign them so it's much more convenient oh that is uh, 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 that's one of the things that annoys uh, us all that if uh, nobody's available to sign for a delivery they take it back to the depot and you've got to chase up the yeah. tracking number and that and often uh, at or well, sometimes they won't even allow you uh, a, a re-delivery or uh, go to the depot or something that's uh, complicated like that has has there been any I'm, I, I mean it's only a uh, become widespread during this coronavirus pandemic the uh the working from home product productivity if uh there has been a benefit for it yeah i think there has i mean i've sort of spoken to a few people who have worked at home they had to get used to it right because they weren't used to it previously but uh yeah i think some people have realized that actually it's you can be more productive you can be more creative um you don't have to compress everything into necessarily nine till five uh, and you know some people have different work patterns i work earlier in the day I don't work so much later in the day. I just find that works for me. Um, so I don't comfortably fit into a nine to five, five day a week um, thing. I just do what I do when I want to do it. I think there's, there's positives, but you have to be disciplined, right? And so some people are finding it really complicated and difficult because there's nobody breathing over your shoulder to make sure that you actually met a deadline and you did something. So you have to build a, a bit of discipline and maturity around it. But if you can do that, I think it's very positive. Well, I'm uh, back to uh, broadcasting from ho uh, from home. Uh, I've got uh, a really fast uh, NBN uh, where I currently live now, so it's completely viable now. So we're no longer at our, our broadcast studio. And yes, I'm not commuting uh, half an hour and back to the, the studio, which can be longer during peak hour, not churning through that, uh, that petrol. And I'm able to well, yeah, also uh, have more flexible work pat uh, patterns. For example, when I wake up in the morning, I just want to go straight and and do 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 some uh, work on the the unshackled and maybe have breakfast a bit later. Where if you're going, if I'm going into the studio, you have breakfast first and then go into the studio, pack your lunch and all all, all that 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 sort of stuff. But hey, I work for myself, so uh, I have the the ultimate flexibility. Yeah, me too. I've been running this here for a couple of years. I did my first live stream two years ago from my studio here. And uh, I've built the studio out a bit foot more since then, but uh, it just changes completely the way you do things. So yeah, that's, I, I enjoy it. We'll yeah. never go back. And uh, I think it's also uh, assisted your uh, uh, co-host, uh, uh, John Adams, uh, because he would only ever do uh, uh, interviews in studio now, but obviously in the age of social distancing, I'm sure that he he phones into your uh, your, your show. Now I was trying to. Uh, this was even before uh, the uh, the lockdown began. I wanted to, to to interview him again, but he wanted to wait until he was in Melbourne to come into the the the, the studio and that. So it's given him a bit of a a a. It's a jolt to sort out your own broadcast. Yeah, that, well, that's true. That's true. But he's uh, unfortunately got a very low bandwidth. Um, which is why he can't do video as well, which is why I only do audio. So he's you know, have a static picture of him with a 
you know. But anyway, we can still make shows. So hopefully, well, he'll be back in in the studio here quite soon now. But um, yeah, it's quite funny. <laughs> He's made some progress in in that regard, which uh, uh, which I like because well, all of my interviews now have been uh, remote as well and we've even managed to get uh my co-host for the uncuckables uh david hiscock from xyz who's as the expression goes a uh, boomer tech he's finally sorting his tech out uh as well but uh it certainly uh hasn't uh, hindered well uh our our growth and in, in your growth as well as i mentioned you're nearly up to forty thousand subscribers your live streams nearly hitting uh, a thousand and uh, well, one thousand three hundred and thirty three was my biggest live stream ever that was a couple of weeks ago and uh, the 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 super chats there there's now not enough room on the on the screen to to keep them uh banked <laughs> up as well which uh, i'm sure is very exciting for you yeah no it's certainly interesting i i, I had a, a live show with a guy from perth last night we were on for an hour and a half talking about the property sector and, and, and investing. And we had so many people who wanted to ask questions. We could have gone for four hours, I reckon. We still wouldn't have covered them all. But anyway, it was fun. So it shows what you can do. Uh, so your website is uh, digitalfinanceanalytics.com? Uh, uh, Correct. Yeah, yeah, that's the blog and, digital, and the website. And then Walk the World is my uh, primary uh, YouTube channel. And the one with John Adams is um, in the interest of the people. Well, I've enjoyed having you uh, back uh, because, as I said, uh, well, uh, things have changed as uh, the global economy does uh, since we since we last spoke at the beginning of the the year. Uh, love to have you on, on again uh, towards the end of the year. To well, in, who knows where we'll be at uh, then? <laughs> It'll be different. It'll be different from where we are today. I'm always happy to come back and chat some more. Good to talk to you. But you'll be uh, more accurate than than all the economic talking heads on on TV and in the treasury. I, I have no doubt. Well, we give it a get. We give it a shot. I can't <laughs> promise. <laughs> all right. Take care, Martin. Cheers. Thanks very much. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows. And to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.